Hello, my name is Artek Karitsunyan and I would like to welcome you to this summer school video. Let me start by discussing why this video may be of interest to you. The financial soundness indicators, or FSIs, are aggregate indicators of the current health of a country's financial sector and its counterparts, such as corporates, households, and real estate markets. FSIs are essential tools for policymakers to assess financial stability, monitor systemic risks by identifying risk buildup in pockets of the financial and non-financial sectors, and make informed policy decisions, including for macroprudential policy. The IMF also utilizes the FSIs for bilateral and multilateral surveillance. Currently, around 150 countries compile and disseminate FSIs in the IMF's FSIs database. This video introduces the compilation methodology for FSIs as set forth in the IMF's 2019 FSIs compilation guide. The methodology of this new guide aims at enhancing cross-country comparability of FSIs and expanding the coverage beyond banks to include other financial corporations. It incorporates recent advances in international prudential, accounting, and financial reporting standards. In this video, you will get acquainted with the definitions, concepts, and methodology underlying the compilation of FSIs, and you will learn how FSIs can be used for policy analysis. So if you are a financial sector supervisor, regulator, policymaker, financial statistics compiler, or data user, there is a lot of useful information for you in this course. I invite you to learn about the collection, compilation, and analysis of FSIs in this summer school video, which is a nice preview for the IMF's online course, Financial Soundness Indicators, or FSIs. If you want to enroll for the complete course, which is free of charge, you can do so at imf.org learning. You can also find the direct link to the course in the description of this video. The financial soundness indicators, or FSIs, as they are commonly known, are a relatively new set of economic statistics. The FSIs were developed by the International Monetary Fund in the late 1990s. The FSIs are indicators of the current soundness of the financial system in a country and its counterparties, including household and real estate markets. The FSIs developed by the IMF are grouped in two different sets, the core FSIs and additional FSIs. The core FSIs are sector-wide indicators monitoring the current financial health of deposit taker sector and real estate markets for a country. The additional FSIs provide further details on the deposit taker sector and real estate markets. They also provide insights into the other financial and non-financial corporations and household sectors. The 2019 FSI guide is the ultimate authority on FSI concepts and methods. Currently, more than 140 countries compile and report the FSIs to the IMF on a regular basis. The FSIs are also extensively used by the IMF in financial stability and surveillance analysis. FSI data are disseminated in the IMF's FSI data portal. These data are widely used by researchers, analysts, and policymakers around the world. The FSI's database was enhanced in 2022 to reflect the adoption of the 2019 FSI guide. The 2019 FSI's guide recommends the cross-border cross-sector, domestically incorporated consolidation method, or CBCSDI, for the deposit taker sector. This is consistent with Basel Committee guidance on consolidated reporting for banking groups. It facilitates the identification of risks within the banking group 
whether those risks arise in the bank itself or in its resident or non-resident financial subsidiaries and branches. Let's look at how CBCSDI consolidation is applied in a simplified illustration. All units within the big oval are resident in the domestic economy. Resident units include both domestically controlled and foreign controlled units. Note that foreign bank branches are excluded. This is because the consolidation method is based on domestic incorporation. Foreign bank branches would be included in the economy where the foreign bank parent is resident. Note that the foreign branches of domestically incorporated deposit takers and their deposit taker subsidiaries and financial subsidiaries located outside the domestic economy are included in the consolidation. The 2019 FSI's guide recognizes domestic location, or DL, as a consolidation option for deposit takers. DL does not have a cross-border or a cross-sector dimension. It comprises domestically controlled deposit takers, including their domestic branches and deposit taker subsidiaries, and foreign controlled deposit takers, including domestic branches and deposit taker subsidiaries, and branches of foreign deposit takers. DL is generally consistent with supervisory reporting in jurisdictions using a solo bank rather than consolidated reporting basis. DL is appropriate for financial systems where the domestic non-deposit taker subsidiaries and foreign operations of domestic deposit takers are few and small. Let's now look at how DL consolidation is applied in practice. Note that only units within the big oval, which represents the domestic economy, are included in the consolidation. Within the domestic economy, the non-deposit taker subsidiaries of both domestically controlled and foreign controlled deposit takers are excluded from the consolidation. This is because there is no cross-sector consolidation in DL. The 2019 FSI's guide focuses on the CBCSDI and DL consolidation methods. However, there are other consolidation methods that countries, depending on their specific circumstance, may opt to use instead of these two methods for the deposit taker sector. Cross-border, cross-sector, domestically controlled, or CBCSDC, is similar to CBCSDI, but excludes foreign-controlled, domestically incorporated deposit takers from the consolidation. Cross-border domestically incorporated, or CBDI, does not have a cross-sector dimension and thus excludes non-deposit taker subsidiaries. Foreign bank branches are also excluded. You've now learned about consolidation methods for the deposit taker sector. Let's look at the definitions prescribed in Chapter 5 of the 2019 FSI's Guide for the Elements of the Sectoral Income and Expense Statements, or, in IFRS terms, the Statement of Profit and Loss. We will use the deposit taker sector as our example. Note that many of the definitions are also applicable to the other financial corporations, or OFC, subsectors. Interest income and interest expense is a form of income and expense that accrues on debt instruments such as deposits, loans, debt securities, and accounts receivable or payable. The income and expense statement for deposit takers has 13 lines. Interest income, line 1, includes fees and commissions that are an integral part of the effective yield of a financial instrument. An example would be an origination fee, or commission, paid by a borrower to obtain a loan. The amount of the fee or commission should be recognized over the life of the loan as interest income. The 2019 FSI's guide recommends that provisions for accrued interest on non-performing assets be deducted from gross interest income to compute interest income. Recall that this treatment differs from IFRS 9. This treatment better reflects the interest actually earned during the accounting period. Net interest income is defined as interest income, line 1, less interest expense, line 2. Non-interest income, line 4, includes all other income earned by deposit takers. 
Compilers will map the typically much more detailed financial statement data obtained from supervisory sources to the four subsets of non-interest income prescribed by the 2019 FSI's guide. Gross income, line 5, is the sum of net interest income, line 3, and non-interest income, line 4. Non-interest expenses, line 6, are subdivided into two categories which capture all non-interest expenses except provisions or, in IFRS terms, allowances for loss. These categories are personnel costs and other expenses. Personnel costs include the total remuneration in cash or in kind payable by the enterprise in return for work done by employees during the accounting period. Personnel costs are typically one of the largest expense categories and are used in the calculation of earnings and profitability FSIs. All other non-personnel related expenses, including extraordinary expenses, are recorded in other expenses. Provisions, line 7, are subdivided into loan loss provisions and other financial asset provisions. Loan loss provisions are net new allowances for losses that deposit takers make in the reporting period. The amount will reflect one of two circumstances. One is a net increase in expected credit loss, or ECL, which is an expense. The other is a net decrease in ECL, which is income. Other financial asset provisions include the expense incurred to establish an allowance for ECL for any financial assets other than loans which are within the scope of IFRS 9. Net income before tax, line 8, is gross income less non-interest expense and net provisions expense. Income tax, line 9, includes those taxes that accrue in the accounting period which are related to income, profits, and capital gains. Other taxes, such as sales taxes and value-added tax, are recorded in other expenses. Payroll taxes, such as social benefits contributions, are recorded as personnel expenses. Net income after tax comprises net income before tax, line 8, less income tax, line 9. Other comprehensive income or loss, net of tax, line 11, records the total from the Statement of Other Comprehensive Income and Loss in an International Accounting Standard, or IAS-1, compliant set of financial statements. Dividends payable, line 12, are dividends declared but not paid in the reporting period. These amounts will be distributed in future to the owners of the enterprise. Retained earnings, line 13, will be posted to the retained earnings account in capital and reserves. Retained earnings comprise net income after tax, line 10, less dividends payable, line 12. Let's now learn about the definitions prescribed in Chapter 5 of the 2019 FSI's Guide for the Elements of the Sectoral Balance Sheets, or in IFRS terms, the Statement of Financial Position. We will use the deposit taker sector as our example. Many of the definitions used are also applicable to the other financial corporations, or OFC, subsectors. Total assets, line 14 in the table, is the sum of non-financial assets, line 15, and financial assets, line 16. Non-financial assets provide benefits to their owners, but do not represent claims on other institutional units. Examples are property and equipment owned by the institutional unit. The balance sheets of deposit takers and OFCs generally will have a small proportion of non-financial assets. Remember that financial assets are claims arising from contractual relationships whereby one institutional unit provides funds or resources to another. Each financial asset has a corresponding liability. Each financial instrument may be an asset or a liability. An asset on the balance sheet of the institutional unit providing the funds or resources, a liability on the balance sheet of the institutional unit receiving the funds or resources. Currency, line 17 and 24, comprises notes and coins of fixed nominal value. Deposits, line 17 and 24, are standard non-negotiable contracts 
open to the public at large that represent the placement of funds available for later withdrawal. As an asset of a deposit taker, deposits may include claims on the central bank and some OFCs. Deposits placed by one deposit taker with another deposit taker are not classified as deposits on the asset side of the balance sheet and instead are recorded as interbank loans. Deposit liabilities, line 24, are usually the largest funding source for deposit takers. Customer deposits, which are generally considered to be more stable than other types of funding, are reported separately from interbank deposits and other currency in deposits. Customer deposits includes all deposits placed by residents or non-residents, except those placed by financial corporations, central governments, and central banks. Loans, lines 18 and 25, are financial assets that are created when a creditor lends funds directly to a debtor and are evidenced by documents that are not negotiable. Not negotiable means that legal ownership cannot readily be transferred from one unit to another unit by delivery or endorsement. Loans differ in this way from debt securities which are designed to be negotiable. Loans are typically the largest single asset class for deposit takers. This asset class includes many different types of loan including overdrafts, commercial loans, installment loans, finance leases, and repurchase agreements. While not reported separately on the sectoral balance sheet, loans collateralized by mortgages on residential or commercial real estate should be separately identified in the memorandum series for FSI calculation. The 2019 FSI's guide recommends recording gross loans, less specific provisions as a negative or contra-asset item, line 18.ii, on the balance sheet. Loans may also be a liability for a deposit taker, providing a funding source, line 25. Debt securities, line 19 and 26, are negotiable financial instruments serving as evidence that units have obligations to settle by means of providing cash, a financial instrument, or some other type of economic value. Debt securities give the holder an unconditional right to receive interest and or principal payments. Examples of debt securities include bills, bonds, debentures, commercial paper, negotiable certificates of deposit, and asset-backed securities. Debt securities may be held as assets, line 19, or may be issued as liabilities providing a funding source, line 26, for the deposit taker. Line 20 includes equity instruments and investment fund shares. Equity comprises all instruments and records acknowledging claims on the residual value of a corporation after the claims of all creditors have been met. Investment fund shares are shares or units of all kinds issued by money market funds and non-money market funds. Recall that non-money market funds are collective investment schemes such as mutual funds which raise funds from the public. Financial derivatives, line 21 and 29, comprise instruments that are linked to another specific financial instrument, indicator, or commodity. Financial derivatives permit specific financial risks, for example, foreign exchange risk, to be traded in their own right. The value of a derivative depends on the price of the underlying item or reference price. The 2019 FSI's guide clarifies that employee stock options are a form of derivative liability and when issued should be included in line 29 with other derivative liabilities. All financial assets and liabilities not elsewhere specified should be included in line 22, financial assets, and line 27, liabilities. Recall that the 2019 FSI's guide defers to national supervisory standards for the allocation of International Financial Reporting Standard, or IFRS 9, Allowance for Expected Credit Loss, or ECL, to general and specific provisions. General and other provisions, line 30, should be presented as liability items even though they are internal accounts to reflect potential future losses rather than obligations to creditors. Specific provisions reduce the net value of the asset on the balance sheet. 
Capital and reserves, line 31, is the equity interest of the owners in the enterprise. Capital and reserves comprise the difference between the value of total assets, line 14, and the value of total liabilities, line 23. It represents amounts available to absorb unexpected losses. The memorandum series are additional data not found in the sectoral financial statements which are required to calculate the FSIs. The memorandum series can be considered to include three categories. The supervisory base series for the deposit taker sector, series that provide further analysis of the balance sheet for the deposit taker sector, other series require to calculate additional FSIs for the other financial corporations sector and its subsectors, and non-financial corporations and household sectors. The supervisory based series, as the name suggests, are sourced from supervisory data. The 2019 FSI's guide relies on Basel Committee definitions and concepts for the supervisory based series. There are many areas of national discretion in the Basel standards, and jurisdictions often employ national variations beyond the specified areas of national discretion in their implementation of Basel standards. Compilers will rely on national supervisory standards for these series. Exercise of national discretion and areas of variance from the relevant Basel standard should be reported in the metadata. Nine of the supervisory based series have definitions drawn from the various versions of the Basel Capital Accords introduced earlier in this course. These include all of the elements of capital and two measures of risk exposure, risk weighted assets and the Basel III exposure measure. These series provide data necessary to calculate the capital related FSIs. Four of the supervisory based series are drawn from the liquidity standards introduced in Basel III. These comprise the data necessary to compile the liquidity coverage ratio and the net stable funding ratio. The last supervisory based series is large exposures, defined in the Basel Committee standards supervisory framework for measuring and controlling large exposures. Large exposures is the sum of all exposures of a deposit taker to a counterparty or a group of connected counterparties which individually exceed 10% of Tier 1 capital. This series is required to compile the additional FSI large exposures to capital. Even though most of the series that provide further analysis of the balance sheet of the deposit taker sector are sourced from supervisory data, they are distinguished from the supervisory series in generally not being defined through reference to Basel Committee standards. Instead, these should be compiled by mapping the available source data that best matches the definition in the 2019 FSI's guide. If data aligned with the 2019 FSI's guide definitions is unavailable, the closest approximation should be provided with the difference from the recommended definition noted in the metadata. The remaining two memorandum series for the deposit taker sector are generally not obtained from supervisory data. Interbank rates will generally be obtained from the unit in the central bank responsible for financial markets or trading. Surveillance is the term used for the continuous monitoring by IMF staff of the global economy and member countries' economic and financial policies. There are four goals of IMF surveillance. Bear help policymakers respond to risk and uncertainty, protect global financial stability, strengthen inclusive growth, and better understand how the financial sector and the economy affect one another. FSIs are used by the IMF for bilateral and multilateral surveillance. Multilateral surveillance consists of overseeing the international financial system and it is centered on the IMF's Global Financial Stability Report, or GFSR, published twice annually. The GFSR highlights current market conditions and systemic issues that could pose a risk to financial stability and sustain market access 
by emerging market borrowers. The FSIs are among the many data sources used in preparing the GFSR. The FSIs contribute to the identification of risks, which can trigger macroprudential recommendations to mitigate those risks. Bilateral surveillance involves the continuous monitoring of members' economic and financial policies and regular Article 4 consultations. The Financial Sector Assessment Program, or FSAP, also contributes to bilateral surveillance. The IMF regularly publishes reports of staff consultations with country authorities. These Article 4 reports usually include some or all of the FSIs. Article 4 reports frequently include analysis of the soundness of the deposit taker sector, drawing on the FSIs. This reflects the importance of the FSIs in the ongoing IMF surveillance. Let's consider an actual example from the Indonesia 2022 Article 4 consultation. The IMF staff report is publicly available on the IMF website. Trend analysis of bank capital and liquidity, FSIs, indicated continuing resilience in the Indonesian banking sector, with bank liquidity recovering and capital ratios are above pre-pandemic levels. FSIs are also used in the Financial Sector Assessment Program, or FSAP. The FSAP, established in 1999, is a comprehensive and in-depth assessment of the country financial sector, which generally includes some FSIs. In an FSAP, stress testing and another analysis complement and expand upon the insight available from the FSIs. Increasing the country reporters and expanding the coverage of the FSIs, as specified in the 2019 FSI guide, will enhance the macroprudential analysis in IMF surveillance.